on this episode of AV Week. GP Audio is buying the makers of Panacast, serving customers and dealers globally, and scaling House of Worship AV. All that and more, next on AV Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. This is AV Week, episode 391, recorded Friday, February 22nd, 2019. Complimentary AV. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by Extron, industry-leading technology backed by world-class support. And by HD Base T. This is AV Week, your weekly wrap-up of audiovisual news and information. My name is Tim Albright. I am your host with us to discuss the news and information for the week. First and foremost, her name is Corey Schaefer, and I got to hang out with her in ISC, and she is from QSC. Welcome, ma'am. Okay. Tim, good to see you again. Good to see you. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, we got to hang out. It was awesome. Another person that I got to hang out with in Amsterdam, her name is Gina Sansevero, and she is with Atlas IED. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me again. And it was so much fun seeing you and Corey in Amsterdam. And it was my first time in Amsterdam. So that was even cool. Yeah, absolutely. We had a good time. Somebody who was not in Amsterdam, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Luke Jordan. Welcome, sir. Thanks for having me back. You, you get to be our non-Amsterdam ISE person. So yeah, you can't win them all. You cannot. You cannot. Um, but if you want to go Why to Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> Just the law of averages. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But if you do want to go to Amsterdam uh, in conjunction with the AV industry, you might want to jump on that next year because uh, that is the last year. Uh, and Agrarian Systems Europe will be uh, in Amsterdam after that. 2021. Barcelona 2021, man. They head to Barcelona. So it's entirely, it, it depends on your, on your groove, man. It depends on, on which way you flow. So. Well, I, I speak Spanish. Well, then there you go. I can do better in Barcelona. You know, I, I, the one thing I found out the first year I went, which is four or five years ago now, the people in Holland speak English better than most people in the Midwest. So, I but I can talk. I can talk about other people in our group in Spanish without. Oh, in Spanish, I got you. I got you. Okay. All right. Uh, let's get this show going. Uh, first and foremost, from AV Network, GN Audio is set to acquire Altia Systems. Uh, from the article, quote unquote, the total purchase consideration up to 125 million. Um, for uh, on a debt and cash free basis around 12 million is linked to retention agreements uh, to be expensed by GN Audio during 2019 through 2021. Um, the president and CEO of GN Audio says, we are pleased to have reached an agreement to acquire Altia Systems. Um, the acquisition further strengthens our unique value proposition by delivering leading integrated audio and video communications. If you're not familiar with either of these folks, real briefly, uh, Altia Systems, makes the Panacast video, uh, video uh, conferencing camera, incredible camera, um, has a, a hundred panoramic. Three, yeah, panoramic um, and high quality video, great stuff. We actually got a video of them at, at ISC this year. Uh, GN is known primarily for audio, right? So it, this will be an interesting acquisition to watch. Corey, I want to start with you on this. First, kind of where do you see this this acquisition and, and kind of these two companies coming together, give it a year, right? Or give it two years. Where do you see that combined company heading? So clearly they're headed for, um, you know, that some revenue from the huddle room space. And yeah. I think uh, it's going to give companies like Logitech a bit of run for their money because GN is actually called GN Audio and really known for their headsets in call centers. So they're often in a corporation uh, early and uh, you know, it's really interesting to see this. It's very strategic and really a new um, competitor in the space. Um, and because the other side of their business is really the hearing aid side and they've, um, they've actually been a major leader in the hearing aid side of the business because I ran into them in my uh, former life. And uh, even at CES, they introduced some interesting technology for hearing aids, which is based on um, sounds and what's happening with that. So it'll be really interesting to see if they can kind of apply some of that technology into the meeting room space, the, you know, the huddle rooms, you know, et cetera. So um, 
I, I really surprised by this acquisition. Actually, I thought it uh, would have been done by another company. You mean somebody picking up Altia, not not the correct? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, because right. this just seems so you know just kind of a bit out of their uh, typical space. It does. It does. You know, a company that is known for audio suddenly getting into video. Um, yeah. Not uh, unlike Plantronics and, and Polycom a few months ago, actually. Uh, that one also still uh, you know, takes me by surprise. Um, Gina, when it comes to bringing two companies together, and actually, like we just talked about with, with Corey, two companies that are, are so vastly different in, in what they do, from, from a, a, a talking to client standpoint and, and bringing this to folks, um, what advice, I guess, would you give to GN, GN Audio, saying, look, you, know, you, you are in a completely new space now. These are some of the things you might want to talk to not only your existing clients about, but new ones about these two, these two combined uh, groups. So until I took this job at Atlas IED, I would not have been able to answer that question. And now I can answer that question very clearly. Um, Atlas Sound bought IED about 10 years ago. And that transition is still happening. Um, and, and from the outside, um, from a marketing standpoint and from a um, discussion standpoint with our clients, they are, they are one entity, right? Um, but the cultures are still separate. Um, we are working towards unification. Um, there is no animosity. It's not a negative. Um, but you can see the difference in, differences in how, uh, how people work and how they work together and their communication styles. And I think that ultimately, if, if these two companies want to come together and they want to transition quickly and they want to transition well, you have to take into account existing cultures and make sure you're not overriding one with the other. I think there has to be really a shared interest here in bringing them together. So um, on, on top of that, there is that always that outward communication and being transparent with your clients on both sides about how this transition is going to go. But I think internally, it's a cultural shift for everybody, um, but making sure that they both have ownership over that is going to be really important. All right. Luke, uh, Gina said it really well, the fact that you've got two different cultures, you've got, you have two different companies here. From the, the commercial integrator spot, from, from the, the, the dealer, you know, talking with Gina and Corey or, you know, the, their equivalents uh, at, at GN, what do you want to hear, right? When, someone, when, a, when a company that you already do business with um, brings in a new technology, purchase a company like this that's completely different than what they've been doing, um, or even maybe buy somebody that's, you know, kind of ancillary, but, but add something to the value. What do you want to hear from, from the, these folks as they come to your office and say, hey, here, here's, a, here's a new offering? Yeah, I think the first thing I want to hear is I want to know about it. <laughs> um, I think having dealer support is, I mean, if it's, if it's a product that goes through a dealer network, is just super important. When I only hear from my, my rep, once or twice a year, that's not enough of a pulse on my business um, to really be worth anything. So having, having someone that can say, hey, this, this deal just struck, we blew the news, here's how it's going to affect you, or there's some new products coming down the pipeline, wait for Infocom. Um, getting that type of, of feedback is important. Um, getting questions uh, fielded, so you know, maybe even talking to the integrators, hey, what would you like to see with these two, you know, coming together? We got the audio, we got the video. What, what products are missing in the market that you wish we could create uh, just a package solution for? Um, you know, I think uh, Crestron has started putting the Hudley uh, Go cameras as part of their, their packaged deal. It's a fantastic little camera, um, but it, it really does make for a, a better, you know, one line item piece of conferencing equipment that I can put in. Uh, and the Panicast has been great for us on, on some projects. So I would, I would be really interested in seeing what are some, some package products we can use um, to create. But getting feedback from the integrators as far as what they'd like to see or as we're developing, what hasn't worked and, and needs to be corrected going forward. And then just, again, 
having having the reps on the ground meeting with the integrators talking about how they're they're going to provide support or who the right person to call for this problem is now having that communication is really key and if that's not handled well kind of going to Gina's whole talk about culture if you had culture and then it kind of gets foiled by not knowing who that go-to person is anymore it totally ruins that brand yeah I would say that um, if I were in your shoes I'd want to know what does this mean to me and uh, if I were in uh, GN's shoes my advice would be and, and we used to joke about this is that if you really um, love the brand you'd say hey nothing's gonna change uh, even though you know everything's gonna change but that would be like the corporate message out is this like we value your business nothing's gonna change you know etc and uh, my advice to them would be just over communicate and really focus on keeping existing customers because whenever there's change everyone worries about it yes everyone <laughs> everyone worries about it <laughs> yeah uh, from top bottom absolutely uh, all right, our next uh, story comes to us from our friends over at AV Magazine. Datapath is expanding and strengthening uh, their international support. Datapath is a U.S. based or a U.K. based uh, company. They're adding to their U.S. Um, base uh, in uh, Pennsylvania with John Hohenstein, uh, who is managing their their key customer relationships uh, here in the states. Gina, I want to start with you on this. We I mentioned at the top of the show that we were you and and Corey and I were at ISC. That show has gained a lot of its growth from the U.S. contingent going over to, to ISC. Uh, last year's percentage was somewhere in the neighborhood of 30%. I'm not, I'm not aware of them releasing this year's percentage yet. Um, but last year, 30% of, of those attending were from the U.S. They were U.S. Or they were North American um, integrators. As folks both expand you know, beyond their borders, let's just say that in general, because I'm trying not to be US centric or North American centric, but whether it's an integrator in the UK expanding out further into Europe or over into, into the States, or it's a North American dealer you know, expanding out beyond their borders, how can companies do what Datapath is, is apparently trying to do, support those dealers beyond their own, you know, their, beyond their own headquarters, you know, Atlas is, is based, you know, a division of MyTech, they're based in, in Phoenix, right? Uh, but you guys have offices and, and support, you know, globally. How have, have you guys been able to do that? And how would you, you kind of um, uh, counsel other companies to do the same? Um, well, you know, that's a really good question. I, um, I wish I knew a little bit more about our strategies um, overseas. We do have locations in the UK and Paris and um, China. And, and so we do support global, um, not only global dealers, but distribution as well. The, the, the one thing that I'm seeing is this kind of reinforcement of the idea of a global company. Um, and, and especially in, the integrator channel, we're seeing a lot of integrators taking on enterprise style companies um, like a BOA or like a, you know, a JPMC um, where they're, they're creating cookie cutter or tiered standards for their rooms, um, which makes it a little bit easier from a manufacturer standpoint to be able to support global installations um, with that kind of standardization, right? So, so we know that our speakers um, or our amplifiers will be used the same way in every room with the same products with and the same types of connection points. And maybe the only things that we have to worry about are power supplies, right? So, so from a from that kind of standpoint, um, the globalization doesn't necessarily change from what I can see within my own organization doesn't necessarily change how we support as long as there's good communication with those global dealers about standardization, about what to expect and about um, when to expect things. All right, very good. When I, when I read this, sorry to jump in, when I read this, I thought that, you know, they're doing what everybody wants to do, which is get closer to the customer in territory and ultimately provide a great experience. And I watched the, live stream at PSNI of the end user panel. And this, kind, this topic actually came up kind of about, you've got these large companies that are wanting to own a customer, right? Globally, and does the customer particularly, you know, will they choose a company because of all those locations? And what I heard on that panel was it really depends, right? Because 
it's about the experience of the boots on the ground. And, and you off, even though it might be one company, one, uh, one of the phrases was I buy, what was this phrase? It's something like I, I buy based on, uh, what they're able to do, not what their logo says, um, something like that. Right. So even though you might share the same logo, you have, you want to have a consistent experience on the ground and you may not have that even if it's the same company, you know, so I think, Every one of us at Atlas, and I'm seeing it with distributors, integrators, certainly manufacturers, we're all trying to provide this consistent support globally because that's what the customer wants and needs. Yeah, absolutely. And and we, the part of that conversation, we'll put a link to it um, on on this episode's page. Um, part of that conversation, we were talking about the the globalization and. and Four out of the five of those folks on that panel, those end users all had, you know, global offices. They had global, you know, offices throughout the globe. And that was part of the conversation was whether or not you wanted one company, you know, one integrator in yeah. this standpoint that you could, re you could rely on. And the, the feeling, at least the experience of, of those four folks, right, was they would rather hire good qualified folks that maybe adhere to a standard. May, they, may, they may not be the same integrator right. in Dubai as they are in, in, in Dallas, but they are both certified by the same company, right? Or certified by the same organization. They both have CTSDs. They, they, in this case, the, the PSNI, they're both members of PSNI or, or you know, they both do you know, AQAV. That's the thing, that, that's the consistency that they're looking for because you're right, you, you can't guarantee um, a McDonald's-like experience around the globe. Uh, you can't guarantee a Starbucks-like experience around the globe when it comes to certain um, technical um, technical skills, actually. Right, but that's what customers are asking for, though. Yes. Right? Yeah. Go ahead, Gina. Uh, I'd be curious what Luke thinks about that because um, organizations like USAV, like PSNI, they are they, – they're coming – they're, they're – uh, essentially pooling resources for like-minded dealers and quality-minded dealers throughout the United States and the globe. So when you're, when, when let's say a Luke decides that he's go, he, he won a job in China and he looks to PSNI to say, okay, who can you connect me with there that's going to be like-minded folks? He still doesn't own those folks. Yeah. Those aren't his employees. How do you maintain that standard of quality with somebody else's crew as you're expanding globally. And I'm probably the worst person to talk about this with because- You need somebody we are, new then. We are no, so I had a completely different question for you, Luke, but go ahead. <laughs> but, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, it's awesome, <laughs> that's why. We're here. So we are, we are so committed to doing the best job that can be done in Fort Worth, Texas and, and maybe 60 miles radius around that, that we will gladly turn that work down. Um, I'd say we've got a couple caveats to that. I'd say that we are committed to serving Fort Worth and Dallas-based corporations that call the DFW area home and might have a satellite office that they, they would just love to have that experience with our people at that office. Uh, we do have relationships with, with integrator partners for, for some of these situations um, in case we decide that it's not a good time or something else doesn't fit with our value prop. But we are, we are so committed to doing a consistently inspirational job here that we are, we are looking to turn work away in order to make room for more work here that really fits with our personality, with our values and our customer experience. But so I'm, I'm, I'm not in the, I'm the worst person on the global conversation for that end. No, no, really, here's, here's the thing. So, and this wasn't the original question I was gonna ask, but you are, you, you make, let's say you make a really good relationship with, with a client and you guys just do a kick butt job uh, and they trust you and you are a trusted advisor of theirs and they come to you and say, Luke, we're opening an office in, in London. We want you guys, right? We want the same quality that you guys give us. How are you going to service that? Now, I understand, I understand what you're saying, right? You're going to turn that job down, but you're still going to try to help that client. How I, would, I would do the design. I would, I would fly with them to London and I would do interviews. 
I would, I would become a part of their team and, and I would say, look, I'm turning this job down, but I am, I am more than happy to, to vet an integrator with you. I am more than happy to tell you if, if this is a, a reasonable, um, even just price for the installation, I'll do the design. Um, or, or even then, I, I might even say, man, I don't even know about local codes in this area. I don't know if that same design is going to work with the way they do business in London. Is your, is your London office looking to do it Dallas style? Because they're not JRUing. So let's, let's get someone that's local that can actually speak to the way that culture does the same thing that you do here. But I'll fly with you and I'll be on that, that team. That's the thing. It's about serving the client, not getting the work. Uh, the, the profitable way to serve the client is, is to get the work. Um, but when you have a relationship that lasts 10, 20, 30 years, you can turn away work and still have a fantastic working relationship with that client. Matter of uh, fact, you often earn more respect, right, Luke? Because they say you're not willing to just take on any job it, it, because you have our best interest at heart. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, let's wrap this, this show up with an uh, 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 article out of Santa Communications about uh, actually House of Worship. Um, from the article, um, actually, uh, Tony Vargas wrote this one. AV technology is an essential component of modern worship, uh, and as ministries grow and mature, so do their AV needs. However, many churches tend to improvise and make shift and do make shift solutions to their AV needs until a more permanent um, professional solution can be implemented. Luke, I actually want to start with you on this. Two questions here. How, how do you help this market when they're growing like this, where they, 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 they're highlighting a specific situation or a specific installation here, where either their, their, their uh, audience is growing, you know, the pe people, the, the members of their church is growing, and so they're either having to go to multiple services or, or separate you know, off-sites, and they're doing these, these temporary structures, right? temporary AV setups. Or their needs are, are growing, either the, the ministry team is growing, and so they're kind of duct taping on, you know, solutions onto an existing system. Understanding budget needs and all that jazz, how do you, how do you walk them through the process of, I understand you're trying to get to here, and you're here, let me help you. You don't do bad work. Okay. The, the biggest thing you can do wrong is waste the funds they have now on solutions that don't meet their needs uh, in a few years. I think nothing is more frustrating, uh, especially if they have to take out a loan to, to even get these, these upgrades done. Uh, there's just nothing more frustrating, especially in a church. The, the, the church is not a, a for-profit entity. The, they do not have a revenue-producing uh, segment. It is 100%. They are being stewards of the money that people are trusting them with. Yeah. And so if you put in quality that you know is not going to meet their needs, but it meets their budget, or if you don't give it the same attention you would give a half a million dollar church system because, um, you know, they're, they're, they're small fish. They don't get all your attention. So they, they get a, a bastardized uh, design that's the worst thing you can do. I would rather say, uh, I actually did this recently with a client. Uh, last summer, they called, and I said, yeah, that's about a $30,000 ask. And they said, we have $20,000. What can you do for $20,000? I said, nothing. Uh, I said, we need to control the you room. You turned down a lot of work, dude. Do what? I said, you turned down a lot of work. So Harvard turns away a lot of students every year. <laughs> ah, that's good. Yeah, no, it really, your rejection rate does say something to how much are you putting in the pipeline and how much of it, how much about yourself do you know that you, you want? I also accept a lot of work. That's why I'm still here. But you, you have to understand, you have to play the long game. You know, not every project needs D&B and L acoustics. Not everything needs a, you know, 128 by 128 Dante enabled uh, mixer. Sometimes we can still do an analog mixer, put in some good speakers and some processing, and we can scale for growth when it happens. Um, but just understanding what's the minimum quality to do the things they want to do. If they can't do that, maybe challenge putting 
the quality they want in. You know, if we want to go to these these types of services, well, you can't afford the equipment that's going to make that work. So maybe your church service doesn't look like that until you have the money in three years. Uh, but you don't do bad work and you, you don't give them bad quality things. When I read the article, one thing I noticed is the last investment they made in audio was 14 years prior. So, you know, I think with this audience and probably with this vertical, it's um, they need whatever gets put in to serve them really well over time. And so they really switched from the analog to digital, which can still give them that. Uh, you know, that long, um, that long time of use. But I mean, you know, they made a decision after 14 years uh, of, from their previous investment. And it looked like with that integrator, they did look at items they could repurpose. And I think there was just the sub or something that they were able to repurpose, but everything else, they really needed to look at um, how do they get them in, in with a system that will serve them well over time and meet their needs today because um, a, a lot of what this uh, article is about is just that um, the, the, the experience at this particular church has, has changed greatly, meaning music's become a huge part of the experience. And this is, I think, a common issue with many houses of worship today where even five years ago, they, aren't, they weren't doing the same experience that they're, they're offering their um, patrons today. Yeah, absolutely. Gina, to, to, to Corey's point here, how, how can, you know, manufacturers help, you know, folks like, like Luke, um, whether it's in engineering services or, you know, um, you know, helping walk them through, you know, maybe offerings that they, maybe they didn't know, you know, I, I always use this, uh, this from Atlas. I always use this from QSC. Well, maybe have you considered this when they come to you and say, you know what, here, here's a, it's a growth path, right? It's a growth plan this is where they want to go, but this is where we need to start. How can you guys help them do that? Uh, well, I mean, um, like a lot of manufacturers, we offer design assist. And I think that design assist, um, it, it does not make us experts and it does not, it complements the designers on the integrator side. Um, a lot of people think, well, why do I need design assist if I already have designers? Um, it's complementary. There, we work within your standards. We work within your framework. We work within whatever limitations are applied. Um, but that design assist allows us to look a little bit deeper into our product mix than a lot of the designers and the integrators would would even know existed. Um, so we can find the right product for your need, or like. Miracle on 34th Street will send you to gimbals because we can say, I'm sorry, you know, what we have doesn't exactly fit within this framework. Um, we would love your business, but it's just not going to work out this time. And, and like Luke said, you know, you, you don't want, you want repeat business, but you don't want it for, um, for the wrong reasons. So I think that uh, a design assist is definitely something that, that dealers um, no is available. I think that they hesitate to take advantage of it, um, but it has nothing to do with we know more than you. It has to do with, you know, we, we can dive a little bit deeper into our product lines. I was going to say the design assist, you know, we offer it as well. And what's cool for an integrator is that we kind of do, well, we know our products better, right? Because we're doing them every single day, day right. in, day out, when the integrator doesn't have that same experience. And we're able to look at things like, okay, we're out of inputs on the particular mixer but maybe the amplifier gives you four more inputs and you know you only need two more and you've got two to grow so it really allows us to look at things kind of in a clever way mm -hmm. because because our design teams are looking at our design assist teams are looking at this stuff every single day yeah i i think it's it's helpful from an integrator standpoint uh like you said, Gina, it's complimentary. I don't call and say, "All right, I've got a RFP for a sound system. What should I use?" Yeah, here I really, you go. Build it for me. <laughs> it really is just kind of like, a, "Hey, I'm I'm looking at your product line, and I'm struggling to choose between these two products. Or given these factors, what which way would you lean for for this portion of it? Or like you said, Corey, I'm I'm running out of inputs, and." I just haven't used this line enough to know. I've been blown away by some of the recommendations I'll get on that. And and I at least try to make a really good point of reading the design guide. And even if it's something I'm not familiar with, I'll read the design guide. I'll, I'll sketch it out. I've got, you know, sketches all over the place. And I'll just, 
you know, I got, I'll, I'll sketch it out and I'll call and be like, all right, this is what I want to do. This is how I think I'm going to do it. Is that the best way to do that? And sometimes I get a thumbs up. Other times it's, well, I see what you did there, but I think it'd be more cost effective to substitute this product, upgrade this and move this around. And you still accomplish what you're trying to do, but you just cut your budget by a third. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, that will do it for us. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, Miss Corey Schaefer from QSC. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks for having me. You can find me at Corey.Schaefer at QSC or Corey Schaefer all over social media. All right, very good. Ms. Gina San Severo from Atlas IED. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Tim. It's a pleasure to be a part of this amazing crew today. Um, you can find me at Gina Sands on Twitter. Um, Gina.SanSevero at Atlas IED uh, is my email. All right, very good. And Mr. Jordan, sir, thank you so much. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you. You can find me on Twitter at TD Albright. Oh, uh, <laughs> that That is avnation.tv. <laughs> don't, don't follow that. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> Please follow me, like, and subscribe. Yeah, like, and subscribe. All right. Uh, I'll let you get away with this time. Uh, uh, my, right. That actually was my Twitter handle. Uh, but you can go by the website, avnation.tv. Avnation.tv. You'll find this program and a host of others. If you're paying attention to our website, though, in the next week, uh, you will find a brand new monthly program. And I'm incredibly uh, excited about this. Uh, at number one, I'm not hosting it. Uh, a very fabulous young lady by the name of Lenore is hosting our new uh, digital signage uh, news uh, digest. It happens. It's a monthly show and it actually posts this next week. So uh, take a look at that. Uh, also, uh, check out Matt Scott's show. It's a weekly look at Resi Residential, which is basically AV Week for the residential. So all that and more at avnation.tv. That's avnation.tv. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. That's all the time we have for AV Week. Thank you.